Good evening, this is John Milburn for Laws 11057. We're into week five of Term 2, 2017. The emphasis this year is on two things, actually three. Professional presentation, legal research skills, and technology. We are very fortunate to have some technological gurus in our class this year, so thank you for contributions that you have been collectively making. I'm somewhat uh, advanced in my marking of the first assessment to do with the professional portfolios. For those that have prepared material, on average it's very good. Most of you will get good marks, and when I say good marks, somewhere between 14 and 19 is what I'd regard as a good mark in law. So, well done, and uh, the work that you've been presenting is good. Okay, um, given that one of the key areas that I'm keen to advance is legal research, I can indicate to you that we're going slowly through the areas um, week by week now. There will be a catch-up phase. In order to understand the legal research process well, you of course need to identify the appropriate websites and then work your way through those websites. But when you work your way through the websites, you need to be thinking like a lawyer. And chapter eight of your text deals with legal thinking skills. So when you read that text, if you and, and this is really last week's material, but um, so I presume that you have already read that material. But as you read the material, think about how the process of thinking like a lawyer and legal logic will help you with your legal research skills and your legal writing skills. Bear in mind in week one I told you about a quote that was at page 267 and that is thinking like a lawyer means keeping a cool and clear head and speaking or behaving rationally when other round, uh, others around you may be panicking or overreacting. Keep that in mind as you work your way through the course. Okay, so what do we mean by legal thinking skills? Well, probably the first thing that comes to my mind is the acronyms. And no doubt many of you have come across acronyms and by now you should be thinking about your favourite acronym. The most common, the one we cite the most recently or the most often is IRAC, I-R-A-C. Now, we all know what that means? All right, I'm getting a lot of nods on the screens. Thank you. So the issue, the rule, the application, and the conclusion, IRAC. Another one is MIRAC, which is M-I-R-A-C, which is the material facts, the issue, the rule, the application, the conclusion. I think that's probably better, to be honest. Another one people use is CIRAC, the conclusion, the issue, the rule, the application, the conclusion. So these are all things that you can do to assist you in thinking logically through a legal problem. I really think it's important to identify the material facts. And unless you identify what is a material fact, I don't think you can truly identify the legal issues and then go on to consider the rule and applying the rule. So that's why I like MIRAC. But most often you hear people talk about IRAC or IRAC. Um, on page 269 of your text, there's an excellent example of how you can apply this in practice. So have a look at page 269. And once you've identified the material facts, you then need to consider what are the legal rules. And it's not always obvious. So I won't go through the exercise right now. But when you do, and I'd urge you to do so, think about what's involved in the case relating to Kevin's club. This is what's on page 269. And as you think about the legal issues after you've identified the material fact, you might start to think about some of the areas of practice that you'll study in more depth as you proceed through this course. You've heard now about torts law, T-O-R-T-S. You've heard about contract law, consumer law, company law. They're all issues that may be legal issues relevant to the case involving Kevin's club. So your job is to identify those material facts, 
then I try to identify the legal issues and think broadly when you do so. It's very easy to fall into the trap of thinking, well, this is clearly a contract law case, and then being blind to other opportunities that might be available to you if you argue laterally. So quite often, you'll mount an argument in the alternative, or you'll provide compound arguments in support of a particular case. Now, have I lost anyone there by that discussion? You can unmute your microphone. You can ask on the chat facility. All good? Okay. Um, and there may be different legal principles that apply in a particular case. So when you look at page 270, the exercise asks you to identify what facts are relevant. And what you need to do is think about three things when you're looking at a problem and you're trying to determine the material facts. The first one's pretty obvious. What facts are relevant is the first thing. The second thing is what facts are not relevant, I guess by a process of exclusion. The third thing is maps not as obvious, and that is what are the facts that I should know but are not obvious to me and I'll need to ask a question to elicit more information. You see, clients are very good at providing you with their version of what they think is relevant, but sometimes it's all clouded in emotion and maybe they fail to tell you something that's really quite significant. I mean, an example of something that may be highly relevant but not mentioned to you by a client relates to, for example, the fact that the client was dealing with a company and not an individual. They may say, or they may think I'm dealing with an individual, but it may be that you need to extract information to determine whether, in fact, they're dealing with a company or an individual. Another one that's highly relevant is in relation to something like the statute of limitations. Now, when did this event occur is highly relevant because uh, that may have a, an absolute bearing on the case. So think about that third issue. What fact is potentially highly relevant but not known to me now, which will prompt me to ask a question? Now, in the exercise on page 270, everything that you need is there to determine the major issues about Catherine who's shopping in the supermarket for some avocados. So when you look at that exercise, you'll see that what is relevant, at least to my mind, is that Catherine's shopping in a supermarket. She selects a, an avocado. She gently squeezes it, places it in her basket, and then attempts to return the avocado to the display and is stopped by the store manager. That's what I think is relevant when you look at the question on page 270. So when you look at that question on page 270 or that scenario on page 270, there's a whole lot of things that aren't relevant from a legal perspective. And if you've got that open on your, on your book at the moment, you'll see it. I mean, here are some of the examples. What's not relevant in the case involving Catherine at the supermarket and the avocado. If you've got it there, I'll give you a minute to look at it. And you can give me some, you can unmute your microphone if you wish and tell me what's not relevant. I've told you what I think is relevant. The fact that she was cooking a Mexican meal. Mexican meal, thank you, Sundari, not relevant. Anything else that's not relevant? The fact that she went to get corn chips. Corn chips, yep, not relevant. Thank you, David. That it was a Saturday morning. Saturday morning, doesn't matter two hoots whether it was a Saturday or not. Yep, very good. They're the first four things, three things on my list. Sarah? No? It's Cassandra. I'm here, I'm just looking, I'll be there in a minute. That's all right. Anita? So I said the corn chips, but I'm also wondering if the fact that she squeezed the avocado is relevant or not relevant. Um, yeah, arguably it's not. I think it probably is relevant in terms of the overall narrative, but arguably it's not relative, uh, relevant. Sorry, I did put it in the relevant column, but mm -hmm. I could stand to be corrected there. Thank you, Anita. Okay. Cassandra? No? Hey, Sharon? Also, yep, sorry. Um, in relation to that as a question... What about 
the motive for putting it back. Mm. So I would have thought that, well, that's what I was thinking. I would have assumed that it was not relevant, but I wasn't sure. I mean, if okay. it was a, no, it's a crap avocado. And I only discovered that after I put it in my basket. Okay. Um, um, look, perhaps. Avocados at home? Yeah. Sorry, is it relevant that she's got avocados at home? Yeah, yeah that's relevant. Of a number of. I don't know if that is relevant. Does it make? Do, would that make a difference? No, I'm saying it's irrelevant. Irrelevant. Yes. Thank you. Yep. That's what I agree with that. Um, I also, yeah. So I had the the fact that she had three avocados at home in the fridge, not relevant. That was in my not relevant column, as was the fact that she left and then returned to the fruit and veggie section later. I didn't think that, that was relevant either. Okay, so what are the legal issues then for Catherine and the avocado? Mind you, this is, in, this is going into second year stuff now. Yes, David? She's gone through the process of actually selecting the avocado and put, putting it in a basket, which is kind of on its way to sort of fulfilling a contract with the supermarket. Yeah, and that's why I think squeezing it is perhaps arguably relevant is the handling the fruit tantamount to acceptance of an offer? I thought, John, the um, the amount of time it took for her, like if she picked it up and then simply remembered and dropped it, that would be a bit different than walking away and then a few minutes later coming back. Perhaps. It might be part of the overall narrative, James, yes? Yeah, yeah. Um, is it really a contract? No. At that stage? No. no. Good. Yeah. Who said no. that? That was Nicholas? Yeah, it's not. It's an offer to treat, John, because un until we get to the actual no, uh, the uh, register, until that point, it's an offer to treat and the shop owner can refuse to actually sell us that avocado. Yeah, that's right. So it's a bit, it's a bit of, it is a bit of a trick for, for um, new lawyers to think that um, – the uh, supermarket, by placing the item for sale with a price, is offering to sell it to you at that price. It's actually an invitation to treat. You'll learn more about that in contract law, but it is a relevant legal issue for the point of what we're trying to achieve in analysing this um, thing on page 270. So the point that I'm really trying to make there is that unless you identify the material facts, I don't think that you can really appropriately consider what are the legal issues. Okay. I guess I've got a favourite of acronym, and that is C-M-I-R-A-T, um, or C-M-I-R-A-C, rather. And um, what that stands for is conclusion, then the material facts, then the issues, then the rule, then the application, and then the conclusion again. The reason I like to say the conclusion is that when you're preparing some advice or whether you, when you're um, making submissions to a court, often the reader or the court, as the case may be, will want to know where you're going from the outset. So if you announce your conclusion, then they can follow your logic more easily and they're not wet, uh, waiting with bated breath, so to speak, to see where you're going with all this. Sometimes there's an advantage too. If you're in court and you make a submission, for example, on behalf of a client in relation to a criminal law matter on sentencing to indicate that the final submission is that the um, uh, defendant not serve any term of actual imprisonment, you may get that surprised look from the court saying, well, you're going to have to convince me of that. If you do succeed in convincing, that will make you look so much better as far as the client is concerned. But that's a side benefit. The real benefit is that the judge or the magistrate, as the case may be, knows what you're intending to establish through your submission, and then you work hard, you pedal hard um, to get there. Do you understand where I'm going at with stating the conclusion first up? You don't have to, but that's just one thing that I like to consider doing. Any questions or comments? Yes, Sarah. Method mentioned in the um, textbook, the, uh, the CRAC method, starting with the conclusion, then the issues, then the rule, then the um, application, and then the conclusion again. So um, that was a, I found that really convincing, especially since um, a lot of 
other stuff, not just legal stuff that requires you to start an argument. You kind of have to know what position you're at to figure out how to justify the argument itself. So I always thought that starting with the conclusion of going where you're going is a good way to keep on track. Absolutely. And um, so I favour that CIRAC method as well, but I just add in the M at the start. So it's CM. So you're, dealing, you're still dealing with the material facts. I think that's a good way of looking at it. Now, James, did you want to say something? Oh, no, sorry, I forgot to unmute. Right, no, that's fine. Anybody else wish to make any comment? Good, all right. So think about what process, what legal logic you favour and work towards that when you're preparing your legal research, when you're writing an advice or an exam paper or you're preparing your submission for a court, uh, think about those issues. Following on from that, in practice, sometimes it's very good to commence a case after you've read the material and decided what you think is the appropriate response to actually write your closing argument and then work backwards from there. And that's a common theme. I think I've mentioned that a few times and I'll probably mention it a few more times yet. The, the theme of working backwards, I think, is very important in lots of ways when you're dealing with legal issues. All right, so let's talk more about legal reasoning. In your text, you would have seen a number of examples of legal reasoning. Deductive reasoning. So what is deductive reasoning? Well, we're deducing something. So we're saying that all X is a Y. Got that? All X is a Y. This Z is X. So what's the conclusion we say about Z and Y? That they're the same. Exactly. Thank you, Nicholas. Because all X is a Y, this Z is X, therefore Z equals Y. That's kind of the deduction that you make. An example, all dogs, X, are mammals, that's Y. This animal, Z, is a dog, X, therefore this animal, Z, is a mammal, Y. Sounds like maths, doesn't it? And it's rather intuitive but sometimes it helps just to write that down. I wish they wouldn't use why in those examples because why is a question. You're questioning the question of the question, John. It becomes confusing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> true. That's true. It's like, yeah, some, when we have those different abbreviations for different things, don't we? All right. So inductive reasoning is, well, what's inductive reasoning? How can you summarise that? Can someone give me a phrase? It's using a series of repetitive examples to induce what will be the li likely, next most likely outcome, i.e. X is Y, X is Y, X is Y, therefore most likely the next X is Y. Excellent. Very good. So it is a prediction based on experience. These things have happened in the past, therefore we can logically predict something will happen. We can induce, we can make an inductive, a reasoned statement to that effect. Very good. I What's reason? review notes on my blog for oh, okay. my other courses um, right. covering, uh, was I covering reasoning or something like that the other day? So that was the reason it was fresh in my mind. So that was there ready to go. All right, so what's reasoning by analogy? Can someone just give me a brief summary of reasoning by analogy? What does that mean? Cassandra, are you ready to go? Yes, I'm just looking through. Can you hear me? This is the first time I've been on. Yeah. We I can hear you. And I, I selected you because you hadn't unmuted. So. Yeah, I wasn't sure. I'm not sure what I've done with this. I've left my laptop at work, so I'm on my iPad. So I okay. don't know <laughs> exactly what I'm doing here. So no, that's fine. You're doing really well. I'm just trying to listen in and, and follow for my first meeting. So and No, and, and I'm very pleased that you've joined us. Thank you very much for doing that. If you do wish to unmute, probably bottom left-hand corner of your page. But okay. while we've got you there, um, reasoning by analogy, any thoughts on what that means? Uh, no, not really. So what do I'm we still, mean by... Still... Yeah, and I'm putting you on the spot, aren't I? Yeah. All right, yeah. so when we talk about an analogy, we're really talking about something 
in one thing suggests something else will have the characteristics of it. But um, you do need to, yeah. I was gonna. I was gonna wait to see if anybody else had a had a had a thing, but I do have a a definition for it. It's as you say something. We say that uh, one thing has a characteristic of another thing, and therefore, if something else has the same characteristic as the first thing, it may, by analogy, have the characteristic of the comparative thing. So you know, A is uh, has the characteristic of X. Uh, B is similar to or shares certain features with A, therefore it shares characteristics of X. Perfect. Well done. That's better than I could say it. So thank you, Sarah. Um, so you can see that the reason we identify those these things is that you will intuitively practice these uh, as you work in law, but it's nice to be able to put a particular label to it and you might need these sorts of reasoning skills when you come to legal research because uh, you'll be looking at cases and a series of cases and then mounting an argument, for example, that something is likely to occur um, because of these reasoned cases in the past. But there are some traps when it comes to reasoning. So if you look at faulty reasoning, you'll see there's a number of different uh, traps that we call faulty reasoning. So, uh, and some of these look like genuine reasoning, um, but they just go a little further or they depart from proper uh, reasoning. So sweeping generalizations, if the main premise is overstated, then the conclusions drawn will be invalid. Hasty generalization, there's just not enough evidence to really make that um, argument. So it looks a little bit like inductive reasoning, but it's too hasty a generalization. There's not enough evidence to support uh, the sort of argument that you would um, mount through inductive reasoning where there's a prediction based on experience. There's more evidence to support the argument when it's inductive reasoning as opposed to a hasty generalization. Attacking the person just because a person is a uh, because a bad person has a trait, that doesn't automatically mean that a bad person will always have a certain trait or characteristic. Appeal to authority. This is the opposite of attacking the person. This is what a well-credentialed person says is not necessarily true. And it is okay, particularly in law, to question what is being said. I mean, for example, we have 4-3 splits in the High Court. So that means that um, just because a High Court judge rules it in a certain way doesn't necessarily mean it's good law because that judge may have been in the minority. That judge may have misstated the law. It's a hard thing to, to suggest that a High Court judge has not stated the law correctly. But as a lawyer, your job is to advance the alternate argument. And sometimes that means that you have to um, overcome a suggestion that just because something is said to be this way, then you must accept it. You have to be brave in the face of the contrary argument at times. The straw man argument is faulty reasoning because it's the practice of unfairly misrepresenting or exaggerating your opponent's claim. To some degree, a straw man argument is making a, a, a bit of a mockery of the argument. It's inflating the argument unfairly or exaggerating the claim in order to make a point. You need to be aware of these sorts of faulty reasons so that you are able to respond when you're the, um, when you're the object of these arguments from your opponent. And sometimes the good old irrelevant or irrational rather correlation and causation. So an example of something that is an irrational correlation and causation is this statement. During the last 100 years, we've seen less pirates and more global warming. Therefore, global warming is caused by a reduction in the number of pirates. You see, it's an irrational correlation and it's not reasoned at all. Okay, so think about those issues. Go through the examples in the text and I'd suggest go make up your own examples and hopefully that can stay with you. And as Sarah has done, prepare some notes 
uh, so a one-line statement that you've got ready for, for uh, future use. Okay, so being a lawyer means thinking critically. And to be a critical thinker, you also need to be reasonable. So it's not just criticism, it's got to be informed criticism. And you've got to ask yourself whether your argument is reasonable. Now, here's the test. When you come to make an argument, you must think about the very clever, insightful question that the court is likely to ask you about your argument. And what sort of questions, in general terms, is a court going to ask you when you present an argument on behalf of your client? What sort of thing is the court going to be interested in? Well, it goes something like this. It will be, well, say in my case, Mr. Milbert, if your argument is correct, doesn't that mean Y and X in the future? And you've got to be ready for those sorts of questions that relate to the logical extension of the argument that you're making in a different context. So if you argue that by placing the avocado in the basket, that by the conduct of the party constitutes an acceptance of a contract, if that's your argument, then you've got to think about what the logical implications of that might be in a related but different context. And the judge will be thinking about that because the judge, particularly in the high courts, is concerned about the precedent effect of a judgment that might be made. So they're going to be thinking about what does this mean? If I accept that argument, What's that going to mean for the future? Because I, to some degree, I'm creating some law here. So that's what I mean by think about the logical extension of your argument and the questions that you may need to be ready to answer if you're in a court situation. Now, any questions about that? All clear? Yes, Lisa? Did you have a comment there, Lisa? Can't hear Lisa. I think we've lost Lisa there. All right, but if you have a question, just uh, unmute your microphone and use the chat facility. All right, so thinking skills, page 290, really important. What I want you to do is look at those thinking skills and just make an honest assessment of where you're at at this stage in relation to those issues. Thinking skill one, interpretation. Interpretation, are you able to determine the material facts in a legal problem that's presented to you? Hopefully you are. Tonight, in the discussions we've had, you've demonstrated that you are very capable of identifying the material facts. That's critical in your ability to interpret the material. Number two, analysis. Are you able to identify the hidden features are you able to look at the material carefully enough to understand that there might be something that's hidden and you may need to go exploring? That's what we mean by analysis. So remember, of course, that some of these words are important in an exam context as well as practice because your exam question throughout your law degree might be, here's a statement, blah, 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 critically analyze that statement. So if you're going to accept what I'm saying to you now about analysis, it means that you are required in that statement to identify the hidden features, amongst other things. Evaluation. You'll see this as well. Evaluate. Um, you know, in this, deci this decision said this and this and this. Evaluate the decision. What does that mean? That means your ability to assess it. Inference. We've talked about that as part of legal logic. Your ability to draw a conclusion, explanation, your ability to communicate the results and self-regulation, your ability to apply other skills to your own thinking. So when you read this in the textbook on page 290, think about it from the perspective of 
how that will affect your thinking in practice, and importantly, more pragmatically, how will that affect your thinking when it comes to answering an examination question? So if you're asked to analyse something, you need to understand what that means from a legal perspective. So these are skills. Can you put those skills into action? That's what you've got to ask yourself as you read through the material. And have a look at the attributes on page 296. The question I'd like you to ask yourself when you look at those, and if you've got your text there, have a look, is how can you improve your skills in relation to these attributes? If you accept that there are a number of attributes of a lawyer that are important and they're identified, ask yourself, what's happening? And we've lost Lisa. She just said the satellite's really having trouble. So I thought that was the case, Lisa, before. Okay, so here's some of the skills. This is all examinable, of course. Inquisitiveness. Do you have an inquisitive mind? Alertness. Self-confidence. If you're not self-confident, and that's an important attribute, what can you do to improve your confidence level? Knowledge is a key to that. Experience, working hard. Open-mindedness is important. Flexibility, fair-mindedness, self-honesty, prudence, diligence, and persistence. So I agree with that list of attributes for a legal practitioner. That's all very well. Don't uh, read them as if it's a list that must be memorised. Read them as a list and ask yourself, how can I improve those skills? Creative thinking. As a practising lawyer, you need to be creative. You wouldn't have thought being creative was something that practising law is all about. You'd think it's more applying the law, but you've got to be, you really do have to be very creative. So I take ADR, one of the second year subjects, and that's all about dealing with alternate ways to resolve disputes other than proceed by way of litigation. So as a lawyer, part of your job is to identify a possible range of solutions to a legal problem and have ways to, to deal with different uh, difficult conflicts. In about week eight, we will deal with that. We'll do some brainstorming sessions and um, we'll be looking at scenarios and trying to put all this together. So for the next few weeks, we're dealing with legal research and legal thinking and then we'll put it together in a more concrete way. By that stage, I want your legal research skills to be right up to scratch. So, speaking of legal research skills, what do we mean in a more abstract manner? Well, the first thing you've got to do is think about this. From a legal research perspective, where do you begin when approaching a legal problem. You've now identified the material facts. You've perhaps identified in general terms the legal issues. Where do you begin? Well, we've mentioned maybe using IRAC or whatever acronym you, you think is important, and that can be your overall template for solving the legal problem. But you certainly need to know the, the library resources and the databases that are available to you. We've mentioned a few. We'll mention a few again tonight. If you haven't had a good look around these databases, then nicely, I'll be disappointed because I want you to go searching through these databases. I want you to explore. Part of my personal email address has 1492 in it. People laugh and they say, 1492, you must be old. I thought, no, that's an exploration year. Those of you that have got some history background know what that means. So um, when you're doing your research, just go exploring. Just spend a couple of hours just poking around, playing with the websites, following links, no particular uh, technique in mind at the start, but just get to know what's available to you. From that, you can develop a research strategy. And you need to have a search strategy. You need to be able to answer this question. All right, says a prospective employer. Legal research, what is your search strategy to a legal problem? You can I have an answer to that? Okay, if you don't have it now, that's fine. But I was going to say, did you want a legitimate answer? Because... <laughs> do, you, do you have one, Sarah? Uh, I do, in fact, have a reasonably legitimate answer. I was okay. at the hospital today, so I had time to work on my 
the start of next the next assignment. Okay, so do you want to share that strategy. with us? Yeah, thank you. All right. Uh, step one: identify the problem and what I need to find out. What I already know. So I need to know the topic, the area, background information, that sort of stuff. Then need to know where to look for the information. So in the case of background information, am I looking at textbooks, journal articles, commentaries? Then I need to identify what primary sources are going to be relevant. Well, uh, criminal, civil law, and then what areas specifically under those areas. Um, then I need to know what argument I'm making so that I know what information I'm looking for when I'm doing my reading. And then it's time to take notes from the reading, uh, finding relevant content to support my argument and also points that might be against my argument that I can counter, essentially. Um, and then it's writing and proofreading. Um, and then it's looking for flaws in the argument, so you know if you need to do more reading or we'll find more information. Um, and then it's final proofing and practice, essentially. That's excellent. Well done. You are well advanced into the second assignment. Does anyone wish to make an... Oh, I think that's great. But you each need to develop your own list and your own technique for research skills and what is your search strategy. So thank you, Sarah. You might share that on you, crew, but we'll see. Thank you. Um, it would be good if you did. Thank you, Sarah. Okay, so if you're in an employment situation or you're answering a question about research strategy, you can't say, I'll just Google it. It's not going to be, that's not going to work. Um, so when you're doing your, your legal research, you understand the need for referencing your material and the importance of referencing correctly. Okay, so let's break it down a bit more. Legal research for legislation, legal research for case law. I think that's a starting point uh, in that order. Secondary materials probably after that. So you're going to have to have some answers to these questions. And I'll go through them quickly. And you don't, you don't have to write them down, but I just want to see if you actually know the answers to these things. So the first is, if I said to you, legislation, where do you find legislation? Can you tell me? You don't have to answer, but I just want you to know, can you find legislation? What website would you go to? Any, does anyone want to answer? I think it depends on um, what sort of legislation you're talking about too. So whether it's Commonwealth or state or whether it's uh, international. They are Perfect. Available. Absolutely. Yes. So if it was Commonwealth, Jackie says Ostley. Legislation.gov.au. Legislation.gov.au. Okay. So you've got to know exactly where you'd go. What about regulations? Where would you go for that? And Gay's right. It depends on whether we're talking state, Commonwealth. Okay. You don't have to answer now, but I just want you to be able to know these things so that if we have these sorts of questions raised later in the course, but of course you'll have your answers ready to go. How do you make sure your legislation is up to date? You check the dates and the uh, for any updates, reforms, or Very good. such like that. Excellent. And if I said to you, all right, when you're doing your legal research into legislation, if you had to find an earlier version of the legislation, where would you find that and how would you find that? You need to know that. The reason I say that is that you might be dealing with a matter uh, that relates to a charge, a criminal offence from 1990. So you want to know what the law was in 1990. So how would you find that? Where would you find that? You don't have to give me an answer now, but I want you to be able to know these things. So when you're looking at these websites, I want you to be thinking about these sorts of aspects. How do you find it, the... It's... Yeah, sorry. I was going to say the simple answer to finding all of those things is just go and watch Anthony Maranak's video on finding case law, John, or finding legislation, and all the answers are there. They are, 
it's an excellent presentation. I'm sure I've put that on the website. Under you have. It's legal in, research. in week five. Yeah. yeah. And it's in, like there's a page of some videos. So Anthony's series of lectures from last year provide a lot of the answers to all these things. So read, uh, listen to those videos and, and uh, consider them carefully with pen in hand, um, ready to pause. And I would urge you to have these websites open so that you're following along and learning as you proceed. So really active listening and active learning. Um, you need to know about how to read the legislation, where are the definition sections, how do they assist in the process of uh, interpretation. Some of you are doing statutory interpretation. You'll need to know when the Act comes into effect. You'll need to know about subordinate legislation and how to find red regulations. See, a lot of these things will come to you as well if you just go through the um, websites and you're prepared to search and look around. Follow some links and there'll be a lot of moments where you go, ah, oh, there it is. Okay, now I've got it. You'll need to make some notes for future reference, but these things are important. And same with cases. You'll need to know how to find case reports online. You'll need to know about case citators. Can anyone tell me an example of case citators? What's a case citator? Isn't it where um, you go and f find the original case and then all of the other case sets, cases that it cited to make its point? Yeah, um, that's, that's true. But sometimes a case citator will help you in terms of identifying the cases that are relevant to a particular section of legislation or um, the cases that are relevant to a point of law or an issue, a legal issue. Yes, Sarah? I would have said that a case citator is a tool for searching for like cited what, what where certain things are cited. So you, if you're looking for stuff that cites um, a legislation relevant to a particular argument, such as cases, to use those as case law backing, you would use a case citator, note in the legislation you're talking about and possibly even the subsection that you're referring to specifically, and it will bring up the, the cases that have cited that uh, content. That's it, yep. So if we're talking about cases that are relevant to a section of legislation, we call that process noting up a case. So um, a really easy way to do it, one you can do straight away, is go to Ostley, have a look at some Queensland legislation, have a look at, oh, I don't know, Section 74 of the Property Law Act, um, and then go to Note Up, which is on the top right-hand corner. Click that and you'll see a list of cases. And Anthony does deal with all of these things. Um, other citators, Jade Barnett is a really good citator. Um, there is case base, which is through LexisNexis, or first point, which is through Westlaw. So they're all legal citators. Um, you, you probably only need, say, maybe three or four good citators uh, references. Two of those are free, two of those are subscription. Um, definitely get to know those. And from that, you, you can ask yourself questions like, all right, so what is this head note? You'll need to know the difference between authorised and unauthorised versions of cases. Um, you'll need to know uh, how to read the case, um, how the majority opinion is formed, um, what, what are the dissenting judgments, how are they used, things of that nature. I know that's all quick and I'm really just asking you to ask yourself lots of questions that you can answer as you privately study these cases. But we need to be good at this stuff. Any questions, comments, all good? All right. Then you need to present your material, putting it all together. Uh, that comes back to the first thing that I'm really keen on, the professional presentation. I am very impressed with the professional presentation of your portfolios, the ones that I've seen. So thank you very much. And that will then work into the second assessment, which is the legal problem solving toolkit. And, you know, the idea of that second assessment, the toolkit is this. It's got to be really personal to you. It's got to be something that works for you. It is an exercise that's accessible, but it's really important because this is how you are able to reflect on your skills as a researcher. 
So you've got to have the problem solving kit work for you. John, All right. yes, Sarah. Um, I just had a quick question with regards to that assignment because, as I said, I did look at it today, um, and I posted on your crew that two of the links were working. The one that was lurking had a list of uh, the information, which I didn't have an issue was, but there was um, lists to references beyond the textbook, um, and I don't like. I'm not gonna, probably not going to have too much of a trouble with that because I've I've done seven other years of university work, so have covered some other content. Um, but I was wondering what sort of other references you were looking for with regards to uh, strategic planning for problem solving. Yeah, that might be a good one if you don't mind for you, Crew Sarah, so that we can explore that a bit more in depth. Would that be okay? Yeah, okay. I'll chuck it up after this. Okay. I have a, I, like I said, I only just got home from driving back from Perth, so I haven't even got to the website yet. Wow, driving back from Perth, that's a long drive. All right. Well, actually, I'm not sure where you are. Maybe I'm thinking from a Queensland perspective. But um, It's a two-and-a-half-hour two hour drive. Oh, okay. Um, we went down yesterday. My granddad had uh, some brief, uh, like a skin graft, done on his head today and then we had to come back tonight. Right. So a long work. drive, but thank you. Yeah. Right, so if you could raise that, that would be good. Um, and Hannah asked a question about the toolkit. Uh, I'll get you to raise that on you, crew as well, Hannah, so that we can start to explore those things in a bit more depth. Uh, so I'm just not uh, getting too caught up in it just at the moment. Okay, so if we have to talk about some basic skills, I would refer you to section, uh, sorry, section, I'd refer you to page 192 of The New Lawyer. Page 192 provides you with an overall scheme, if you like, for your basic skills. Number one, you need a systematic approach. You need to know where to look. You need to obtain good quality information. And look, I think really if you know LexisNexis and Westlaw, um, possibly CCH, that'll be the, the three main ones from the university library the subscription services, uh, the free ones, there's the authorised services, the uh, Office of the Office of, uh, Office of the Queensland um, Parliamentary Council, the Federal Register of Legislation, and Ostley and Jade Barnett. They're probably the four that come to mind that are free services, but there's more than that. Oh, the Supreme Court Library is excellent too. If you haven't had a look at the Supreme Court Library website, do, do have a look at that. Okay, so... The basic skills, systematic approach, know where to look, get good quality information. Then this is really important, the issue of reading actively and efficiently. Um, you've got to speed read and you've got to be able to peruse. Peruse means read in detail. Sometimes people mean, think peruse means scan over it. Scanning is very different to perusal. Um, and with the pace at which you read depends on the circumstances and often you need to to adopt this practice of having a broad approach and then narrow down. Once you've identified what you think is the real uh, deal, the important aspect, you then need to peruse, you need to read carefully. But all of that is in the context of thinking laterally, brainstorming, which we'll deal with later on. I'd urge you to read um, page 196 of your text, which deals with planning your research and thinking about the way you approach this. This is all part of the toolkit for you. Consider the time frames, the cost, the consequences. Commence with the broad reading, the primary sources, I think, first. Primary sources, we should all know this now, legislation and case law. Secondary sources, mostly commentaries, textbooks, law journals, things of that nature. Uh, does anyone know about Berlin Connectors? Anyone come across that? Boolean? That's where you need to perhaps connect a few words or phrases. Yeah, there's search board. connectors for you interfacing with a lot of search websites there and or in capitals. Um, you can also use parentheses um, and uh, like question marks to indicate pluralisms or variations on the start of a word and stuff like that. Yes, that's very good. Thank you, Sarah. And um, Sharon um, and Melissa both said the same things, the and or. So what you might want to do is try to find material like this 
which is the Westlaw Quick Guide. Um, and these websites have this material readily available. And if you look, for example, at the Westlaw Quick Guide on page three, and you probably can't see this, but that's a list of some search terms and some of the techniques that you use. Now, if you're not using these techniques, legal research becomes very difficult. So that, uh, that guide that I'm showing you is only six or seven pages, but literally just print it, have it there ready to go, work your way through that. So when I'm asking you to explore these sites, if you have something like that quick guide with you for each of the sites, and they all have them, it's going to make the process much easier. Do that in conjunction with Anthony Marinek's lecture in the background, and it will be easier again. But I can't stress it enough. We have to master this now. Now's the time to do it. We don't want to be asking ourselves, how do we do legal research when you're in third year? We need to do this in the next three weeks. Okay, uh, and do that in conjunction with your preferred legal logic. So that is identifying the facts, identifying the issues, locating the rules, and then interpreting and applying those rules to get your conclusion. See, the rules might be in the statute, the rules might be in the case law, the rules might be in the regulations, the rules might be a combination of all those things. It might be the legislation as interpreted by the case law. So you need to be able to find these things. Uh, so when we say, you know, that M-I-R-A-C, locate the rules, locating the rules isn't necessarily as easy as you might think at first glance. You need to practice that. You need your legal research skills to properly be able to identify and locate the rules is really the point that I'm trying to make. Once you've done your research, very importantly, you need to follow the citation rules outlined in the Australian Guide to Legal Citations. Has everyone seen, has everyone got a quick version of that? If you look at page 222 of the um, text, you'll see an idea of how things are laid out just um, by, by looking at what others have done. But it really is useful if you have a... Um, a guide to the legal citation. I think the Deacon guide has been floating around a bit. That's very good. Yeah. UQ have it's one? It's in, um, it's in, it's in uh, UCrew for a download, John. I put it up there last week. Great. Thank you, Nicholas. If you haven't taken advantage of uh, what Nicholas has added, um, do download, say, the Deacon guide to the AG um, LC or whatever guide you, you prefer. Actually, at the back of the AG, you'll see there's a bit of a summary. So that in itself would be really useful. To be honest, you won't be able to read all the AG LC. It's too involved. But you must have a summary of it and have some quick guides. At the moment, we're not too concerned. At the moment, I'm really concerned to see that you are acknowledging the source of your material if it is sourced elsewhere. The Humsey Hancock situation. Um, but very soon, it will be a case of acknowledge the information you've sourced elsewhere and cite it appropriately, correctly, using the um, AGLC. Okay. The research databases, you know where to look. Definitely look at Ostley, Jade, Comley. Look at Lexis, Westlaw, and... I take it everyone has now accessed the CQU library. Do I take that that's the case? Yes. If, now, if you don't know how to access the CQU library, please don't be embarrassed. Just, just ask. But ask now. Ask in week five. Don't ask in week 10 or 11. Then it, then it does start to become embarrassing. But if you ask now, if you don't know how to access the library, um, probably I'm talking to those that are watching this recording after the event more than the ones that are here, perhaps. Um, just ask. We've got a lot of people that are willing to help. This is a really good group for helping each other. I, I'm so impressed with the support and guidance you give to each other. Please keep it going. 
I was going to say, John, too, there's a, a PDF in Ucrew with a link to all of the sites that we've mentioned over the last couple of weeks, with the exception of the ones that are available through the CQU Law Library. I didn't feel the need to include them because it's something that people need to access from inside of uh, their online accounts anyway. Yep, and I saw that. Thank you, Nicholas. That's that's great, having just that brief summary. And have those things uh, in your favourites, have that document that Nick's um, prepared ready to go, and then start to work your way through those things. Um, make sure that yep, you... The idea behind that document, John, is that you can download it and then send it to your own email accounts and that no matter where you are in the world, you can open your email and access all of those sites at any time, anywhere. Absolutely. And I, um, when I had an iPhone up until last year, I was able to download the Ostly app, which I found really useful in court. I've got a Windows phone now. I can't access Ostly through that app. But, uh, you know, that's a really good resource as well for something on the run. Okay. Um, also, just look out for uh, information guides. There's um, some very good material. Um, I'm going to ask you to have a look at the Queensland legislation website. That's the um, uh, legislation.qld.gov.au. That's the official website at the moment. It's about to change. And follow the link and have a look at the test website under construction. It's much better. Um, and you'll, you'll need to know that. I mean, if I'm running out of time. I wanted to show you a few things here with this. Um, I'll see if I can call it up, but um, I may not have time. But for example, just by way of contrast, have a look at the Planning Act 2016 for Queensland under the current website, and then go to the test website under construction, have a look at Planning Act, and you'll see the difference. You'll see how much better it is. That's just an example of an act. Time permitting, I would have shown you that. Um, also, have a look at the Queensland Law Reporter, the Queensland Reports website. I'll see if I can bring that up. It's taking, it's taking a long time to come through. Um, make sure that you know where to look for second reading speeches. Second reading speeches are also known as explanatory speeches and you'll need, or explanatory notes, and you'll need to, to look at those. Look, I have found this website, Queensland Reports, and I will just sh share the screen and show you this as well. I've got three screens, so hopefully I've referred you to the correct one. So you'll see Queensland Reports. It's queenslandreports.com.au. And in amongst that is the Queensland Law Reporter. I... I have that delivered to my inbox every week. And there it is. And you can see there, click here to register and obtain your free weekly Queensland Law Reporter by email. I'd urge you to do that. It's, a, it's an excellent service. Um, this website is also useful in that it talks about the authorised reports. There's information about the Queensland reports and um, practice direction databases, etc. So that would be well worth having a look at in terms of um, material. All right, we're quickly running out of time again. I'll stop the share. But we get the idea. What we're after is a voyage of discovery. Pick your favourite explorer and channel that mindset and go exploring. Do so with some help, the help of videos from, say, Dr. Marinek, from the guides that have been prepared by the different platforms, such as Westlaw. But mostly, I think it's a matter of you going searching for yourself and making some notes for yourself. Also, make sure you subscribe to the Queensland Law Reporter and Jade Barnett. You should all by now be receiving your daily email of up-to-date case law from Jade. If not, go on the site, the Jade site, J-A-D-E, 
Select the areas that you're most interested in, click the link and you'll get an email every day. You can choose weekly, I think, but I choose daily. So that's jade.barnett.com.au. Oh, and yes, Melissa said, I also get the weekly email from the Supreme Court updater. I do as well. I forgot about that one. That's really good. So go on the Supreme Court website and get that updater. Sometimes you'll see the same information, but that helps to reinforce things. Okay. We've covered a fair bit. We have a lot more that I want to cover on legal research. We are going to be guns at legal research, yes? Okay. Very good. Uh, any questions before we wrap up, before our one-week holiday? All good? All right. Thank you very much for your patience. Those of you that are listening, I watching this I did post video. those questions on, CQ, on, on Ucrew. Oh, you've so. done that already, Sarah. Thank you yeah. very much. That's great. So we can now start talking about the second assignment in, um, in earnest. And uh, I hope to have the results of the first assessment back to you probably on the weekend. All right. All the best and enjoy your break next week. Keep up your work through you, crew, and we'll see you live in two weeks. All the best. Bye.